It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Lee Jenkins. Great leaders offer help and hope. Poor leaders offer hoops and hype. We're going to talk about help and hope this morning. That's from John Maxwell. A student wrote, this is a rainbow that didn't know how to make a bend. <laughs> well, sometimes we get confused too. People think they're offering help, but really they're offering hoops. And they think they're offering hope, but really they're offering hype. So we're going to talk today, what do we do for help and hope instead of hoops and hype? The agenda we have is vocabulary. Okay. Doesn't that seem like we should start there, right? Some secrets, and then help and hope in the classrooms with continuous improvement. We have four parts to that. We have subtraction, addition, multiplication, and division. And then we have a summary. So let's talk, here's our vocabulary words for this morning. Hoops, hype, help, hope, and continuous improvement. So, what are hoops? Hoops are anything that wastes your time, your money, or our students' enthusiasm. That's what hoops are. Now, we understand time and we understand money. That's, we're, that's common. But student enthusiasm, well, let's look at that just for a second. I asked 3,000 teachers and administrators. I said, what grade level do you teach? Or if you're an administrator, what grade level did you used to teach? And what percent of the students love school at that grade level? Gather that information up from 3,000 teachers, and there is the picture, not so pretty. 95% of the kindergarten teachers said their kids love school. And it's a little bit lower each year until we get to the bottom at grade nine. Now, nobody's doing that on purpose. I've yet to meet the teacher who put in their lesson plans who they want to discourage today. <laughs> so nobody's doing it on purpose. But it's built into the system, and that's why system thinking is so important for us. What is it in the system that's causing that? By the way, this was one of the most uh, important graphs I ever, ever completed, because prior to this, I thought that elementary schools kept enthusiasm high, and enthusiasm was lost in middle school and high school, and I was completely wrong. It starts in, in kindergarten. I mean, think about it. If you've got 25 kindergartners who love school, and at the end of the, end of the year, 24 still love school, and you only lost one, and you lose one or two a year, there's hardly anybody left. Think about what those kids feel like in ninth grade. Two-thirds of them don't want to be there. Here's what they feel like. This is a frog. It got run over by a car. Smoosh. That's what they feel like. Hype. What is hype? Hype is a change with no way to know if improvement actually occurred. We put smart boards in everybody's room. Did learning improve? We don't know, we have no way of knowing. We just did it, okay? So that's hype. We made a change, but we have no way of knowing if we improved. This is a picture of one of my grandsons on a rocking horse going nowhere fast. That's hype. In fact, some people make money with hype. I mean, really, there's a good use for it. It's called a carnival. You get to go really fast going nowhere. And, and, and so we, but we don't want our school district to be like a carnival. Uh, here's an example of some hype I was involved in. Uh, Lois got a copy of my book and gave it to Superman. I have absolutely no way of knowing if Superman read it or if it did him any good. That's pure hype. Help. Help is permanently solving problems. It's not just temporarily. We permanently solve it. I've been greatly influenced by Jeff Liker's books on Toyota. And uh, in his books, he has a two-by-two two matrix saying that uh, we have people strength and we have process strength. So if you're in a system with uh, the wrong people and poor processes, you're struggling. If you're in an organization with great people and great processes, you're excelling. That's what the Baldridge Award's about. If you got the wrong people but tight processes, you're getting by. But if you've got great people and the processes are weak, you're firefighting. My perspective is that most of education in the United States, anyway, is firefighting. We've got wonderful people and the processes need fixing. The problem is the legislators think they need to fix you and I, when in fact it's processes that we need to fix. So, uh, and the band-aids 
of just fixing it temporarily are not cutting it. This is a picture of the earth. It was hurt. Someone put a band-aid on it. It doesn't solve it for long. What's hope? Hope says, I can do this, or hope says, we can do this. A kindergartner wrote, this is a star and it's having a ball. <laughs> hope means every kid at this school is a star having a ball. That's what hope is. And now our last word to define, continuous improvement. It's a record of getting better and better and better. John Maxwell again, he wrote, I only want to be superior to my former self. And there we see out of Canada a student chart of improvement. You can see they're getting better and better and better. Made a mistake and covered it up with masking tape, but getting better and better and better. <laughs> Moving along the way. That's what continuous improvement is. We have a record of it. But sometimes it's not an I, it's a we. So I changed John Maxwell's quote to say, we only want to be superior to our former selves. And there you see, out of an Arizona uh, classroom, took this a, a week ago, this is their math fluency run chart. It's all the kids together in the two-minute time math fluency. How many questions did we answer correctly in two minutes? All of us together. And every time you see a sticker that says ATB, that means the class had an all-time best. It's a we. So sometimes a continuous improvement is individual, and sometimes it's a we. Now, I'm going to share with you some secrets on dealing with these issues. We're going to talk about secrets for help and hope and hoops and hype. We'll start with hoops. What are some secrets that we can have to save time? What can we do? The secret of saving time is located in your purse or pocket. Would you take out your smartphone that you turned off? Take it out. Open up the calculator. You've got it right with you. You brought it. The secret to saving time. Let's say that you saved a minute per period. That's it. You saved one minute of time that used to be waited, wasted, and now that minute is used for instruction. Just one minute per period you saved. So how much time is that? Well, you multiply six times 180 days, and you save 1,080 minutes in a year. You did that for all 13 years of a kid's education, kindergarten through 12th grade. How much is that? You save 14,040 minutes. That's just a minute a period. But we don't think in minutes that high. So let's divide that by hours. 234 hours we saved of instructional time. But we don't think of that many hours usually. So school is usually a six hour day. Let's divide that by six. We saved 39 days of instruction over the course of a child's education by saving a minute per period that was formerly waste with, wasted with announcements and lunch counts and all kinds of other things that now is used for instruction. Where did that come from? I mentioned the Toyota books. Now think about it, a company that has billions in reserve and they were so excited that they saved a couple of seconds per car. A couple of seconds, and I've been talking about minutes. We can do it, folks. So one of the ways to save time, of course, is with the stopwatch. And there you see from a classroom, a teacher, who when she, when she asked for the kids' attention, she started the stopwatch. When she had their attention, she stopped it, but didn't reset it to zero until the end of the day. And all she's tracking is how much time we wasted during the day, with the purpose of having all-time best. We wasted less time today, boys and girls, than ever before. That's what it's about. So the secret, at least one of the secrets of saving time, is in your purse or your pocket. And now we're going to look at money. What is the secret to saving money? The secret to saving money is cost per student. Keep your calculator out. Let's look at this. Assume with me for a minute. By the way, let me see. How many accountants are in the room? 
Raise your hand if you're an accountant. I don't see, I don't think I saw a single hand. So, this is, this spread I'm going to share with you right now is for everybody who's not an accountant. This is for, this is for the rest of us. This is for us. I'm not the accountant either. But let's say you're in a school district with 4,000 kids. You go down to the business office and you say, what does it cost us to empty dumpsters? What's our contract? The person that comes by the school, the big noisy truck, and they pick up the dumpster and they empty it and put it back. What's the cost? Ask them. They'll give you a number. I did this as school superintendent. The cost was $42,080. That was our dumpster contract. But see, I'm not the accountant, so all those big numbers, I had a hard time with it. So then I needed, this is what I needed, cost per student. So divide it by 4,000. $10.52 per kid per year is what we spent emptying the dumpsters. That was, that was not a happy moment to find that out. You see, but when you have cost per student, it speaks to us. And when you see that you're spending more money per student emptying the dumpsters than you are on the library budget, then it really hurts. So cost per student, when we get that information, then we use the continuous improvement quality principles to work at that. Here was my reaction when I saw the cost right there. Can, you, can I hear it from you? Oh, not good news. And now, we're going to look at student enthusiasm. What is the secret to maintaining student enthusiasm? So we don't need to motivate them. They already came to us in kindergarten motivated. But we want to maintain it. What is the secret to maintaining student enthusiasm? What's the secret? It's ears. That's what it is. It's listening. And John Maxwell again, good leaders motivate others by their listening skills. I went into Marion Norberg's room, and by the way, uh, uh, number 10 on the free list uh, that's on your table, number 10 are the where to go to find the Marion Norberg slides of children's writing that I took mine from. But I went to her. She had a K123 combination. I don't know if you can see this, but she held her pencil between her index finger and her middle finger. That's the way she wrote. And I said to her, Marion, you're teaching primary grades. Don't you think you're supposed to hold your pencil the right way so that you um, aren't showing the kids a bad example of writing? You're teaching kindergarten, first, second, third grade, and you hold the pencil between your index finger and your middle finger. I said, why? She said, well, let me tell you. 15 years ago, I went to a six-year-old in my class who was holding his pencil between his index finger and his middle finger. I was ready to show him how to hold his pencil properly. But then I stopped. I bit my tongue and I said, son, why are you holding your pencil like that? And the kid said, well, when I hold my pencil the way the teacher told me, this way, it wobbles more than when I hold it this way. I can write better when I hold my pencil between my index finger and my middle. He didn't say index finger and middle finger, but I hold the pencil this way. She said, hmm, well, maybe you're right. I tell you what, I'm going to hold my pencil this way for two weeks. And if you're right, I'll leave you alone. But if you're wrong, I'm going to have you change. She said, that was 15 years ago. He was right. That is listening, folks. That's how we maintain enthusiasm. It's listening. And Jeff Burgard, in his book, Continuous Improvement in the, in the Science Classroom, described a formal listening process, not the one-on-one -on -one I just described, but listening to everybody. And when his kids come into his eighth grade science class, they tell him the, their attitude towards science prior to coming to him, saying, you know, you're, uh, the free test is not just on what you know about science. It's, it's on your attitude. You're not a robot. I need to know how you feel. And so they might say they loved, in first grade, loved science. They liked it in second grade. Don't remember it in third grade. We'll just put okay then. They hated it in another grade. They liked it in another grade. And he gets the history of their attitude coming in. Then he says to them, 
write down everything you can remember about science in grade one, grade two, grade three, write it down. He gathered all these ideas up from five periods of science, middle school science kids. And, what, and he went back and shared all the information with the kids. And what he found was the, everything under the positive was science. Everything under the negative was methods of teaching science. So he said, you know, some of you, when we did this, early, this chart, you told me you didn't like science, but when I looked at that, everybody, all the kids in my own five classes have a lot of things they like about science, they just don't like how it was taught. So one of the things you wrote on the negative side was, read the chapter and answer the questions. We're not going to do that this year. See, my job, I'm not going to motivate you in science. What I'm going to do is listen so I can restore the love of science that you had in kindergarten. That's my job. It's not to motivate you. It's to put you back the way you were. And so you're going to help me every month. You're going to tell me how you feel about my class. You're going to say you love it, you like it, it's okay, you just like it or you hate it. And that blank graph is on my website. That's why that free is put there to show where the blank graphs are. When I go to Google Analytics and look at what people download from my website, the most common thing is blank graphs. And then the, this is one of them. It's right there. And, and, they, and so the kids just say every month how they feel about the class. A second grade teacher was doing this in math. She went to a girl and said, I don't understand this. You said math is OK, OK. Every month you tell me math is OK. And I know that you love math. I can tell that it's your favorite subject in school. Why are you doing OK on the chart? She said, I do love math at school, but I hate math homework, so I just went in the middle. That's grade two. See, if you don't listen, you don't know. And so we need formal listening. And one of the things that you will see in the seminars is the plus delta, where people just say once a month, students say what went well. In our, in our class this month, and what could I change to make next month better? When you do that with students, you say to them, you know, there's a bunch of you, and there's one of me. I'm not going to be able to make all the changes you suggest. But I'll tell you this, if you'll do the plus delta every month and take it seriously, I will do my very best to make at least one change every month based on what you say. So I went into another classroom was doing this, Shelley Carson. And I said to an 11th grader, is this worth your time to fill out this plus delta every month? Yes. How come? <clears throat> Mrs. Carson makes at least one change every month based on what we say. Hmm. So I went to the teacher, Shelly, tell me something you changed. She said, well, one month, a student wrote underneath the delta, when you promise us 10 minutes, give us 10 minutes. So I went back the next day and I said, hmm, somebody wrote on the Delta, when you promise us 10 minutes, give us 10 minutes. Don't I do that already? And in unison, the kid said, no. <laughs> okay, two steps back. Okay, kids, what do I do? They said, Mrs. Carson, you are hyper. <laughs> After seven minutes, you can't take it and you tell us time's up. If it's only seven, just tell us it's seven, but don't tell us it's 10 and cut us off at seven. She said, okay, kids, what do you want me to do? They said, let one of us be timekeeper. <laughs> so she did. You see what I mean by we can maintain enthusiasm with our ears. That is the secret. And here, from this date, an AP literature class, you see the graph for the class on AP, the vocabulary from AP literature. And that's the total for the class. Every time you see a happy face, they had an all-time best. They had more vocabulary questions right than ever before. But when you look at those graphs, and I've done this for over 20 years, you always see three parts. You always see inclines where it's going up. You always see a big valley. And you see plateaus. So when you have an incline, you celebrate. When you have a valley, you say, whoa, what happened? And they say, teacher, it was homecoming week. We didn't care. Okay? <laughs> But when you have a plateau, nobody knows why it's happening. So then there's listening comes in and you say, okay, kids, what can we do to get our graph going back up? What's your hypothesis? A fifth grade class said, if you, <clears throat> if you would just let us play seven up more often, our graph would go up. 
huh, how is that going to help? Well, here's how it's going to work. When you've got your head down and somebody touches your thumb and, and, and the teacher calls on us, Mrs. Burkhalter, when you call on us, and uh, when and you call on us, you're going to ask us to, to define one of our vocabulary words. If we can define it, we get two guesses, but if we can't, we only get one. It worked. Because they heard this the vocabulary going on all in the game. It works. Who knows? But listen to the kids. In fact, that's what they want. Here's a student's writing about teachers. Some teachers are mean. Some are nice. Some are even made of sugar and spice. So the teachers who are sad, listen to your children and you will be glad. Sometimes children make you feel bad, but in a minute later, you are glad, not mad. That's their advice. And here is some more listening because the student who wrote this knew that Marion Norberg would listen to him. Miss Norberg, please excuse Chris for his math. He got hooked on reading. <laughs> excuse Chris for his writing, too. Thank you. It's listening, folks. The secret of removing hype is baseline data. You've got to have the baseline data. This is the number of referrals to the office every year for nine years. But the first year is, the, it's not good or bad, it just is the number of office referrals. And during that time, no new discipline programs were implemented, but hypotheses were tested to see if, in fact, it would make it better if we made this change. But if you don't have baseline data, how do you know? How do you know? One of the problems I have <clears throat> is getting back to the airport, and I don't know where my car is. Now, you've got the little ticket stub when you come in. So there's three things to write down. What floor you parked on, what row you're in, and what spot. Now, it seems like you should be able to get all three written down and not have a problem. And then when I get all three written down, and I put them on my wallet, five days later when I pull it out, the ink is smudged. And now I don't know where the car is. So I have, so I have baseline data. I know that about 35% of the time, I don't know where my car is. So I've got a new, some, new plan. Just started it yesterday at the airport. There's a photograph of my phone of the aisle and a photograph of the parking place. Now if I don't lose my phone, when I get back to the airport, I'll be able to find the car. So, but, but it only works if you have baseline data that you can test out things. So hopefully we've eliminated hoops and hype. Well, we haven't eliminated them, but we, 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 know how, we know some secrets for getting rid of them. And now the secret of giving help is root cause analysis. We look below the surface to find out what is really the problem. Dr. Deming said that we should ask why at least five times to search out root causes. Why? And why? And then why again? Why is that happening? And why is that? And why? And why? And when you do root cause analysis, you can have no blame storming. That means you can't blame the legislature, you can't blame the students, you can't blame the parents, you can't blame anybody. You only can look at, at items that, that you have control over. An owner of a self-serve car wash was having a problem. Somebody was stealing the money out of the coin boxes, and the first thing he did was blame the workers. Which of you are taking the money from our coin boxes? And they all said, none of us, boss. We're, we're, we're innocent. He didn't believe them. He put the hidden, hidden camera up to find out who's stealing my money. And he found the culprit. He followed that bird up on the roof and found $4,000 worth of quarters. You see, sitting around blaming people almost never solves the problem. What I want you to do, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I want you to agree on a problem that schools have that educators have control over. 30 seconds. Talk to each other.
Okay, I'm going to bring you together. At your table. Raise your hand if your table, if anybody at your table said elementary school spelling. Anybody in here say elementary school spelling. I'm the only one in the room that thinks it's one of our biggest educational problems. It is a huge issue. Why is elementary spelling such a huge issue? Because that is where we teach kids how to cram, get a grade, and forget. In kindergarten, they do not know anything about this. They think you just come to school to learn. We hire teachers. When you interview them, you say, why do you want to be a teacher? And they talk about long-term learning and lifelong learners. And then you hire them to teach first grade, and you give them their spelling words on Monday, and they cram at home on Thursday night, and they spell them on Friday, and they forget them on Saturday. They, those six-year-old kids learn in about a month. They do not need those words after Friday. It is institutionalizing the system of short-term memory. And it is a huge problem. It goes on into chapter tests in middle school and high school. That's where we teach the kids. It's no longer about the learning. It's about the game. Remember when I showed you this slide and said that we got great people <clears throat> and terrible processes? I have heard my whole career teachers complain. I can't believe it. They spell the word right on Friday and they miss it in their story on Monday. And we put a Band-Aid on it and we don't solve it. It is a huge issue for us. Two story, an Oklahoma administrator had her granddaughter for the weekend. Granddaughter was in first grade. She'd been there for a month. She's dropped off at grandma's house for the weekend. Grandma's going to the backpack. Oh, honey, you see you had a spelling test. Yes, grandma. Good job, you only missed two words. Good job. Let's work on those two words. And what did she say to grandma after four weeks in first grade? No, grandma, we don't need those words anymore. <laughs> huge, huge problem for us. And then we've got poor statistics. We use data to communicate to kids that they're losers. Now, it's not intentional. We don't put a sign up that says these are the losers, but when you look at it, you know who the losers are. I was in a, a Phoenix classroom recently. <clears throat> There's the, uh, the, the rows are the names of the kids. And the columns, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They were learning, it's third grade, they're learning times tables. <clears throat> and when they had, quote, mastered the twos, they got a sticker after the name for two. And when they had, quote, mastered the threes, they got a sticker after their name for the three. It took two seconds at the most to say, oh, those are the loser kids and those are the winner kids. So one of the things, when you look at what are the root causes, why is that discouragement going down, down, down? Well, if every day you walk in, there's a big sign that says, I'm a loser, of course. When you dig down under root causes, there's things you find that you weren't expecting to find. <clears throat> Christy was sitting there dangling her legs, <clears throat> and right there by her elbow, she found a parallelogram. She said, how did I make it? I ripped open a toilet paper roll. She thought the only place you ever saw a parallelogram was in the tangram set at school. And there it was, right there by her elbow. I'd been there her whole life and she didn't know it. You see, when you dig in, when you, when you start exploring and looking at what's below the surface causing the problems, you're surprised. You might find a parallelogram. Who knows? The secret of giving hope is continuous improvement. That's what gives hope. You think Jackson has improved? Hope that he's going to get better and better and better in his math? Absolutely. When you can look at that and say, wow, I got two questions right the first week, I got four the second week, I got five the second week, oop, slips down to four, up, up, up. That gives hope. It's a record of improvement. So now, <clears throat> on our agenda, I've talked through vocabulary, talked through secrets, and now we're going to do the subtract, the add, the multiply, and the divide. You ready? Here we go. Subtraction. What are we going to get rid of? <clears throat> what are we going to get out of there? 
<clears throat> what is we going to get out of our system? It does not belong. It's making us ill. What are we going to get rid of to subtract? First thing, stickers. <laughs> I took that picture in a, in a teacher supply store. The owner of the teacher supply store, store allocated more space to stickers than any other item in the store. I'm not blaming the business owner. He's done his research. He knows what educators will spend their own money on. It's bribes. Please, stop it Monday. A couple good reasons. One, it's not working. When I give this number, the numbers I'm going to share with you, I get some disagreement, but the disagreement I always get is the number is too low. If kids are incentivized five times a day, times 180 days, times 13 years, that's over 10,000 incentives. Elementary school is stickers, marbles in a jar, popcorn parties, you know. Middle school, it's grades, video, and food. If, if incentives worked, we wouldn't need to be here. They're not working. But then, the psychologist has done the research. They find that when a student loves to do something, and then you give them things for doing it, now they think, maybe I'm not supposed to love it, and now the focus goes not on learning this because I love it, but now the focus is on getting stuff. Please stop it. Sub instead of stuff, we say thank you. That's all we need is a thank you. It's because it's not our job to motivate the students, but to determine what's causing them to lose their motivation and stop doing it. I want you to be a researcher on motivation. You say to a sixth grader, you told me you don't like science. I hate it. Hmm. Well, when did you stop liking science? I never liked it. You say, whoa, no, not true. You liked everything in kindergarten, which includes science. So when did you stop liking science? What happened? They'll tell you a grade level and they'll tell you what happened. Be a researcher on it so you know, so we can stop doing those things because if at age 14 or 43, we're passive and inert, it's not because it's our nature, but something flipped our default setting. That's from Daniel Pink in his book, Drive. Got to find out what it is. I mentioned this earlier. Bolton boards that have the names of the losers and the names of the winners. I was in a school and they had the length of five classrooms, a huge graph. And, and they had done a lot of work. They had the name of every student on a big circle, probably about 20 centimeters in diameter. And there they had, and every student's name was on the wall someplace along that big length of five classrooms. And there's the, there's the losers at the end and there's the winners at the other end. Now, they weren't doing it to discourage kids. They thought they were actually motivating kids. Well, yeah, they were motivating the kids, the winner kids, and demotivating the others. Let's stop it. We have the wrong definition of fair. We can, we can get it out of there. Fair is not everybody using the same method. So let's think about homework for a minute. <clears throat> is homework a subject or a method? If it's a subject, how come it's not on the report card? And if it's a method, how do we defend grading our methods? You need to think about it. So I asked 3,000 teachers. If a student has an A on every exam, an A on every big project, and never does daily homework, what's the highest grade they can earn in your classroom? There's the results. We're all over the place on whether homework is a subject or whether it's a method. There's no agreement. So FAIR, we need to change it. It's not everyone using the same method, but it is everyone meeting the same standards. That's what FAIR is. Look at this video clip with me. Yeah. Take away eight. Uh, this way. 
I think we've all been there. I didn't want you to learn it that way. I wanted you to learn it this way. So the people who gave B, C's, D's, and F's to the kids for not doing their homework, even though they mastered the content proven by the performance assignments and the background knowledge assignments, they're like, they're like this mother. I didn't want you to learn it that way. I wanted you to learn it this way. How'd you learn your math? By listening to you, teacher, I didn't want you to learn it that way. I want you to learn it this way, Good enough, right? We've got to really think through how do you want kids. It's about what, and I'm not here to talk about the homework. I'm here to say there is not a perfect method. We can have, we can have all the kids meet our standards, but not all the kids use the same method. By the way, if you want to know, know the best solution I've heard for the homework dilemma Talk to me between sessions. I'll be here today and most of tomorrow. Ask, ask me, what, what, what would you do with homework? I'll give you a suggestion. And now back to the permission to forget. We have to subtract that as a possibility. We have to set it up so that kids cannot, they do not have permission to forget. Because 3,000 teachers, what, spend, what, time, what percent of the year do you spend teaching kids content they should already know? and I get a third of the year. It's four years of a kid's life is spent in review and it's 10 years of a teacher's life is in review. Here's some disconnects for you. Hot dogs come in packages of eight. Buns come in packages of 12. Another disconnect. Students are accountable for their short-term memory, but everybody in this room is accountable for their long-term memory. What kind of a deal is that? And then the publishers put the first third of the book in review. States often give the exams in March or April and teachers cannot teach a full year's content in three months. It's a disconnect. What do we do? An individual teacher, here's a, a math teacher. That's her desk. Pictures on her taken at her desk. That's a geometry bucket, an algebra two, an algebra one, a math seven, and a math, she was a pre-algebra and a math seven. And when it's time for the weekly quiz, which is not graded, but she pulls out six uh, concepts or questions from geometry, one algebra two, one algebra one, one pre-algebra one, math seven. First time she did that, the kid said, you're killing us, we can't remember that far back. She said, I'm sorry, you have to. In about six weeks, they said, oh, we always have four easy ones. You see, we can ask them to remember. And here's a school district started off spelling, not giving kids permission to forget from the very beginning. First grade has 150 spelling words. Second grade has 200 more spelling words, no duplicates. Third grade, 250 more, no duplicates. And when it's time for the spelling test in first grade, they get 12 out of the bucket, 12 at random. When they number their paper 1 to 12, they don't know which ones are coming. Because if you tell them, then they cram and forget. You want to know what's in their long-term memory, not what's in their short-term memory. And so there, there's what it looks like in a classroom. That's the third grade classroom. That's the third grade bucket of words, the second grade bucket, and the first grade bucket. So in third grade, 250 brand new words. They get 20 words from third grade. Excuse me, there's 20 words on the quiz, each quiz spelling test. 16 come from third grade, three come from second grade, one comes from first grade. We do not have to set it up so that they have permission to forget and start that cram get a grade process. This is from a first grade classroom. You think, oh, those poor little first graders, they number their paper 1 to 12, they don't know which words are coming, their little psyches are going to melt, how cruel. No, there is a, a word, first grade spelling word chosen at random. There's a first grader taking her spelling test. She doesn't know any different. She doesn't know you're supposed to know the words ahead of time, trying to spell as many as they can. There's another first grader. The word, they don't melt. They can take it. And then every week, they send a note home to mom. Mom and dad, there's week, what week it is. I got this many words right on my spelling test. And now I can spell, and the total number of words out of the 150, how many I can spell now 
all of them all together. That same exact process from Massac County in Southern Illinois in seventh, seven through 12 science. It's the same process. Each of the teachers has the same bucket of tongue depressors with elements written. And when it's time for the quiz, there's the periodic table. There's a teacher with a tongue depressor to know which element to click. And there's what it looks like when you look at the PowerPoint and you click on one of those elements and up comes uh, an A, B, and a C. You click on one of the letters and up comes the question. And when they're ready, uh, when you're going over it, then you click the space bar and the answer comes up. So they've got it all set up. This exact same process to take away the permission to forget that we're trying to subtract. So that was a biology class where the slide came from. And uh, they have five blue tongue depressors to pull out because those are biology, two green ones to pull out. Those are from physical science in grade eight. And two red ones to pull out. Those are from seventh grade questions. And one pink one, which is scientific method, which is the same no matter what grade they're in. I said to these teachers, I said, wow, think about that. If you did this and the kids graduated from high school and they knew, the, and they knew 300 of those concepts really well. Now that's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And it's 300. That's the number. It's not a very big number. For all those years of science, they said, how would you feel? They said, we would be absolutely thrilled if they could graduate from high school, have it in their long-term memory, all the kids, at least that much science. Why? Because now they take chapter tests and forget. They're changing, they're just subtracting that whole process. So what I shared with you, we're going, to, we're going to take away stickers, we're going to take away loser charts, we're going to take away our wrong definition of fairness, and we're going to take away permission to forget. And now we're going to add some things. What are we going to add? We're going to add giving kids dichotomous rubrics, key concepts, and student run charts. Here is a dichotomous uh, uh, rubric, and you can't read that. I'm going to uh, blow this up just a little bit to help you, and, and that'll help a little bit. But really, it's a, it's a, it's a rubric for writing. It's a six, they're on my website. You can download them and, and use them. But it's, there's one for each of the six traits in writing. But when, and this one, did I, it's writer's purpose. Did I state a clear opinion? Yes or no? If yes. Did I support my opinion with, opinion with facts and details? No, and that would go over to a three on the rubric. Yes, and you go on up, and you, and you answer yes and no questions in order, in order to get uh, to, the, uh, to, to the score on the rubric. Here's a dichotomous rubric for reading. But whatever, whatever it is that we're assessing that we need a rubric for, the first week of school, we give the kids the rubrics. They know what it is that's expected of them, and they can follow the dichotomous rubrics all the way through and see exactly what their score is. We give them the background knowledge. There's the first four out of 100 key concepts in science from Jeff Burgard, art vocabulary. There's a kindergarten teacher with vocabulary on the bulletin board. Uh, spelling, they get all the words for the year. The, the first week of school, you give them all of them. It's funny, teachers say, ha. Huh. I can't give the kids a list of 600 spelling words. They'll choke. I said, I didn't tell you to give them 600. Why are you giving them 600? Well, that's how many words are in my spelling program. How many years have you been using that? Hmm? Five, six years, something like that. So you've been giving them 600 spelling words a year for five or six years. Yeah, but I never counted them up. I didn't know how many there were. Well, can they learn that many? Have they been? Well, no, not really. Well, let's think about it, OK? But whatever it is, give it to them. You give them blank graphs. This is for the writing, six traits writing, so they can write which of the trait was, was, was scored that week. They can write the trait and their rubric score. If it's background knowledge, get the blank graph. They can, so they can, like I showed you earlier, they can track how they're doing. We, we, have, to, we have to add uh, quizzes and checks. These are not graded. Some, most of the people use the word quizzes. Some use the word check. And we do this 28 times a year, seven times a quarter. So here are, here's first grade. And first grade teachers want the kids to read 220 adult sight words. So every week the teacher pulls 16 out at random, 
Calls the kids up one at a time, sometime during the week, and says, find the words you can read and read them to me. Takes a minute per kid. But here it is in high school. It's the same. Teacher out of Tucson said, gave the kids a list. Here are 65 key historical events we're going to study this year. One, two, three, four, five. This, here's the order they're in, and we're going to study these this year. Then she took one of those lists, went to the paper cutter, cut it up, got the glue stick out, and glued a key, uh, an historical event on tongue depressors. Went to the kitchen, got a big mayonnaise jar, put them all in there. Time for the weekly assessment. Pulls out eight at random. Why eight? It's because it's the square root of the 65. Pulls out eight at random, puts them underneath the document camera, projects it, and the kids have to put them in order. What happened first, second, third, fourth, fifth? That's what's doing. To know, are they gaining the history? So it is a constant feedback on are they learning the content? We, we, instead of assessing the short-term memory just on that chapter, we're assessing the long-term memory. Sometimes things are written out, as in math uh, standards or math fluency. Sometimes it's done with PowerPoint. Here's a high school English teacher. She has pencils with the names of authors. And when a student pulls up the name of a pencil, then the student goes up to the PowerPoint. And by the way, this is again on my website. You can download her work. And you click on the book written by that author. And when you click on that, up comes a question. And when you're ready to correct it, you hit the space bar, and there's the answer. So we're going to give them the dichotomous rubrics, and we're going to give them the key concepts. We're going to assess them regularly throughout the year so they can see that they are continually improving. And then the, we're going to ask them to track their progress. Kindergarten, tracking his or her progress. Kindergarten teaches in the beginning, they outline where they want the kids to color, but they do the graphing. There's first grade spelling. That graph there, that's high school seniors. <laughs> and there's math fluency. And this is six traits writing. You can see they just, they did each of the traits once, and now they're doing it kind of at random. Each week they, they, do, they work on a, a, a particular trait. And when kids have their all-time best, they do better than they've ever done before. They, they write their name on a shape. It goes to the office. The name is read over the intercom saying that they had an all-time best in, and you name the subject. And there's a hallway. They cover the hallways with all-time best. It's just a thank you. You did better than you've done before. The teachers say this is the best thing their school has ever, ever done for special education. Because everybody is honored. Because everybody can do better than they've done before. But when you say, we will honor you and you get to 90%, Special ed teachers say they're often, often their kids don't make it. But when, you get, when you're honored, when you read 15 words a minute, and then you get to 20, and you've never read 20 words in a minute before, that's your all-time best. You write reading on the shape, and it goes in the hallway. And you had your all-time best in reading. And in a special ed room, there was tracking fluency, that reading fluency I just mentioned. Not only did they write their name on a shape, they hit the gong. Okay. But we don't have to give them stuff. We just have ways of saying, thanks, I'm proud of you. And we're going to add the class run chart. That's adding up the total for the class. You say to a kid that's on an athletic team, how's it going? They automatically give you two numbers. Always give you two numbers. They tell you how they're doing, they tell you how the team's doing. Just, it's just natural. Then you say, to the same kid, how's it going in school? They give you one number. Why? Because there's no team. Add it up, folks. That's the most powerful tool you've got, is addition. Add it up. And there you see from the same classroom I showed you on the right with the dichotomous rubrics, the writing, and they had their all-time best. They got 56 rubric points in the class in writing. They've never been that high before. Add it up, folks. There it is in Latin stems in grade four. Sad face. There's high school biology. Duct tape. Spelling. Every time you see the sticker, that means they had an all-time best. 
There's mathematics. Star, all time best. This class has a goal. Folks, if you don't hear anything else, listen to this. Where does that goal line come from? It does not come floating out of the air from a continuous improvement perspective. The goal comes from the best week the year before. That's where it comes from. Where tr the class knows, they buy into it. We are trying to outperform the prior years. We want to be the best students Mrs. Haruda has ever had. That's where that goal comes from. It's the be it, that's an actual number from the year before. It's not a sitting down macho, oh, where, where, where we might be. No. It's, and when you have an all-time best as a class, you get to celebrate. You get to do something fun. I asked this fifth grade class where I took this picture, what's your favorite way to celebrate? Hamster roll. What does that mean? Well, the hamster's over here, and it's in a hamster ball. We take the hamster ball off of the cradle, we put it in the middle of the room and watch where the hamster goes. <laughs> That's it, folks. It's not fancy. It's not buying stuff. It's just, thanks. Now we're going to have a hope calculator. If you still have your smartphone out, we have a hope calculator. How do you create, how do you, how do you give hope? Okay, this is actual data. This is from the spelling, first grade spelling that I just showed you a minute ago. I asked the teacher when, when she sent the data to me, how many school days did your school have and what day was it? It was the 59th day out of 176 days. Divide it up, they've used up 34% of the year. She has 18 students, taking 12 spelling words at random out of the bucket. So if every kid spelled every word right, there'd be 216 words in the whole class spelled correctly. They spelled 133 words correctly out of the 216. So we divide it. The class has 62% right. Look at that. They're speeding by 28%. They've only used up 34% of the time and they got 62% right. Does that not give hope to kids? Wow, you've learned it twice as fast as we would expect. Can I hear it for the kids? Yay. Yeah. It's a hope calculator, folks. But you know the biggest obstacle I have in what I just shared with you? Teachers say, I can't ask them questions on things I haven't taught yet. Of course you can. Let me see your hands. How many of you, you go shopping, you get some big something, it barely fits in your trunk, you bring it in in the living room, you open up, well, you, you pry open the staplers, those big heavy staplers, you open it up, and the first thing you see are the directions. How many of you, the first thing you do is sit down and read the directions? Let me see your hands. It's about 20% in this room. So that means that 80% of you don't read the directions first. Well, your kids are the same. And when you ask them questions on things you have not taught yet, they're challenged. They want to see if they can get it right and they haven't been taught it yet. That's a big thrill for them to get something right you haven't taught, just like it's a thrill for you to get it put together and not have to look at the directions. We're all the same. So, please, hope calculator. Addition, what did we add? We gave them the whole year's view. We added continuous improvement. We're gonna see the progress all through the year towards what we want by the end of the year. We added the student graph. We added the class graph and we celebrate all-time best. Now we're going to multiply. How do we multiply? Well, we do this for the whole grade level or school. So the kids took a two-minute timed math fluency quiz, and there's the total for all the fourth graders in the hallway. We multiply the effect. And then there is the total for the whole school. Everybody took a two-minute time um, fluency. 
regardless of their grade level. And there's how many questions we got right in the whole school. We added up. And there are spelling words in the whole school. And there's math, math standards, with a line for the goal, which was the best week we had the year before. Well, I shouldn't say just the year before. It's ever, ever in the past. This email was came, sent to me from Oklahoma. Why? Because they were so thrilled. It is a middle school. And then they're all-time best by one question in the whole school. One more right than ever before. So every teacher turned in from their weekliest non-graded quizzes, no matter what their subject was or whether it was at counting up sit-ups in the PE class, whatever it was, at, turned in the number, they had more right than ever. And there is a middle school. The green bisons, because that's their mascot, were when students had an all-time best. Yellow was when classes have an all-time best. And the huge bison is when the school has an all-time best. And there is the run chart. It's free, folks. There is just a sticker every time the school had an all-time best. The reason I like the school-wide ones when you multiply it that way is because the principal is involved. Who has to lead the celebration for the school-wide all-time best? The principal. The, when it's in the class, the teacher is involved. When it's grade level, yeah, the two, two or three teachers, four teachers at that grade level get together. But when it's the whole school, the principal has to lead it. And the principals want to be involved in the learning. But they don't always know how. It's multiplication, folks. Just multiply everybody's efforts and see what you get. This is a school of fish. And the people who run the school hired a shark to be the principal because the fish listened to him. <laughs> Involve your principal, folks. Division. We are going to divide up the work. The kids want to be engaged. In the classroom where my student writing examples come from, Marion Norberg. Uh, both of my sons had her for a teacher, and they were younger. And so um, about the first week of school in kindergarten, Marion said to my younger son, Jim, what word would you like to learn to read today, Jim? He said, caveman. So that's his very first reading word, starting kindergarten. So what he had to do was... Um, she said, I want you to write caveman five times on this slate board. He wrote C-A-V-E-M and came back and said, I'm done. She said, no, not five letters, five words. So he had to go back and write it. Okay, And he wrote it uh, on this slate board. And then he uh, drew a picture of the caveman. Um, and he wrote, then he wrote in his best writing, underneath the teacher's writing, he wrote in his best writing, caveman. And to the left, on the left side, is his sentence he dictated about cavemen. Now, when you, when, but you, the evidence that they want to be engaged is that if they like what they're doing at school, then the young children, when they go home, they play school. And they play school the way it was at school. That's what they're going to do. So a kindergartner or a first grader is playing school with a three-year-old sibling. So... What do you do if you're playing school at home? You say to your younger uh, brother or sister, what word do you want to learn to read today? And the three-year-old said, foot. And there we have the important book from home. Foots are smelly. <laughs> all the graphs are all done by kids. There's a scatter diagram. Obviously, there's no names on those. But to put a dot for how many got right, there's a scatter diagram out of Canada. Kids putting dots for how many they got right. There is math fluency out of Phoenix, took that a week ago, and you can see that it's tremendous improvement as they move on up in the fluency. And uh, this is a high school class. One student per row gathers up the information for that row, and so one kid got seven right, and there's five kids got six, and they gather up that information and, re and then record it. A kindergartner put in a dot for how many got right, and the kindergarten, the teacher also has the kindergartner count up the total correct for the whole class, because you put your dot, or how you did after there's a one-on-one -on -one math quiz. And then when you're done, uh, you put that the same number of unifix cubes in the tray. And this student has been given the task of putting the unifix cubes in clumps of 10 so that we can count up how many we got right as a class. The kids want to be engaged. There's high school, adding up the total for the whole class. Elementary, they made the graph and put stickers for all-time best. High school at the left, middle school at the right, 
middle school again, the kids do the charts. In the school I showed you with the uh, all-time best for the math fluency, they're tracking three things school-wide, math fluency, math standards, and reading. And in the outside of every grade level are the graphs for that grade level. These three kids have, uh, each is responsible for one of the graphs, and they do the school-wide graph. And it's spelling. We're talking about item analysis. Who does the item analysis? The kids. They get their spelling test back, and they highlight the words they spelled correctly from the list they got the first week of school. And then there is in math, in the middle school, and they put a plus or a minus, and they got it right. The kids in fourth grade, taking, and this PowerPoint is on my website, they're taking a, a quiz on seven of the states every week. And so an, an arrow comes up, points at a state, they write down the name of the state. And then when you want to correct it, of course, you hit the space bar, and they keep track. Any state they get right on their quiz, they color it in on their map. There's math. Where they're, and you don't write question one, question two, question three. You write the concepts that came up on the random quiz, and they do the item analysis. The kids do that. There's the most, item, uh, most missed item in the class, and only one student missed that one. And that is the item analysis for the teacher to work with it. There's the spelling words. There's the most missed word in the room, and three words missed by nobody. There it is in high school. It doesn't look any different in any grade level. First grade girl, she has the ability to take the information from the scatter diagram and put it on the histogram. The kids do the work, not the teacher. There's another histogram. And another one, obviously taken at Halloween time. There's middle school. There's high school. Sometimes people wonder why I call my work L to J. It's not about my initials. It is the shape of the histogram. There's the L from the beginning of the year when you have high standards and you're asking questions the first week of school and what you want them to know at the end of the year. It's not, it's, it's, it should look like an L. You have a bell most of the school year and you want to end the year with the J curve. When kids have seven weeks in a row perfect, they test out. So what is this kid doing? What is the teacher doing to keep the kid engaged? The kid's giving the quiz, not the teacher. This is an owl, or two big eyes, or a design. I don't know what it is. It might be an owl, or two big eyes, or a design. You pick which one you like. <laughs> so, you have a choice. You can spend a lot of money on computer-generated data for your teachers, or you can let the kids do it for free. You have a choice. Whether you want engagement, or you whether you want overworked teachers to enter it in after school in the computer. In summary, I hope you've enjoyed the Arizona background pictures. <laughs> we've talked about help and hope instead of hoops and hype. I hope I've given you ideas on how to remove hoops and hype from your system and what, how to give help and hope. And now I have an action for you. When you go on my website, underneath free l support, when you go down there, there's quotations. There's quotations from Edwards Deming, quotations that, from various people in my seminars, and John Maxwell quotations. I want you to join, open up the John Maxwell, and I want you to download the Help and Hope Hoops and Hype slide. I want you to print it. I want you to put it someplace where you see it all the time. Why? Why do I want you to do that? Because we've had an hour together, but if you'll do that, It'll remind you every day, and you will have your own stories, and then this will be even more valuable to you because you have your stories instead of my stories. The follow-up session will not be, as it was mentioned earlier by Joanne, will not be about classrooms. It's going to be, it's going to be administrative, continuous improvement, but in the administrative offices as opposed to the classroom. And when you go to my website, I hope you sign up for my weekly updates. It, and people think, I got enough stuff coming in my email, my in-basket already. You do. But, but I, let me tell you, from my perspective, it's not just sending you something. My joy are the emails that come back to me based on what they, what they read. That's the joy. So I hope you do, and then you send me things. And by the way, um, just so you're not leaving thinking that we left with our uh, rainbow still in a mess, we brought some, some leadership help in to help to fix the rainbow. We got it fixed. 
God made the rainbow and some stars, but they were lonely. So three days later, he made the butterflies and the flowers. Now they're happy. They are friends. So just so you know, we got the rainbow fix that we started off with. <laughs> There's the email. We'll be in contact between sessions and through email. Uh, enjoy the next two days. You're at a wonderful conference. I told you you'd find that inspiring. <laughs>